than chapters one to three of Ephesians, write A. T. Roberts, writes A. T. Robertson, another theologian. By and large, expositors observe it is the grandest of all the Pauline letters. There is a peculiar and sustained loftiness, they say, in its teaching. I'm sure uh, most of you would have appreciated that, uh, which has deeply impressed the greatest minds and has earned for it the title of the Epistle of the Ascension. So there's so much said about this uh, little letter that Paul has written. And uh, I, I hope we've created enough suspense for you to last the next 40, 50 minutes. Uh, here are some opening remarks. So what are some uh, big, uh, important things for us to have at the back of our head as we are looking at this letter? First of all, theme. Usually Pauline letters are uh, written as an apologia or as a pastoral correction to a, a controversy that's uh, you know prevalent in the churches that he planted. But this one is not... Uh, 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 a response to a controversy. There's no controversy. And uh, the church as Christ's body is a big new idea that Paul is uh, getting from God as first and revelation, special revelation. And that's what he seems to be writing and arguing for in this beautiful uh, letter. And thirdly, Praise for the unity and blessing shared by all the believers in Christ is another uh, very strong uh, theme that comes through this particular book. So who was the guy that uh, carried this letter? Uh, we have in reasons to believe a dear senior colleague of ours called Tychicus. And, uh, you know, his namesake, Tychicus, uh, who was a co-laborer with Trophimus, uh, is the one that is actually carrying this letter. We see proof of this in Ephesians 6, 21 and 22 towards the end. It's also important for us to recognize that this is uh, one of Paul's prison epistles. He is uh, in imprisonment and he is writing from uh, his imprisonment. So how do we know that? We uh, have clues about this in Ephesians 4.1. Ephesians 6.20, where he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, and then again he says, I am an ambassador in chains, right? And uh, so it's a prison episode. And the uh, scholars are kind of uh, divided about the number of imprisonments of Paul. Uh, they do know that he was imprisoned in Caesarea. They do know that he was imprisoned in Rome. Some believe he was imprisoned twice in Rome. Uh, I tend to uh, be a little inclined towards that. Uh, we have proof of all of this in Acts 24 and Acts 28. And uh, it, it looks, uh, it appears uh, from various technical angles that Paul was writing this perhaps from his Roman imprisonment. And uh, some say uh, his second Roman imprisonment, perhaps, right? But those are nuanced, minor technical things. They really don't change uh, anything that is central to what he has written in the letter. And speaking of destination, this is an important one, though this book is called as a book, uh, or, or rather though this letter is called as the letter to the Ephesians, uh, it's interesting that the two address is missing, you know, in Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 in most ancient manuscripts. The two address uh, that we find in our current translations of the Bible, Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 is missing in the most ancient manuscripts. And also from the distant tone versus the tone of endearment with which Paul usually writes to uh, personal churches, uh, that distinction is uh, very stark in this letter. Uh, he's already ministered uh, in the Ephesian church for two years, and generally, if Paul spent a lot of time in a particular church, then Paul would use a lot of uh, uh, terms of endearment. His tone would be very endearing. But here, there is a distant tone. Ephesians 1.15, Ephesians 3.22, uh, something to the effect of his having heard about their faith, okay, distance, 
they having heard about his ministry again uh, a distance uh, so there are some in theological circles that uh, think that this was perhaps a letter written to the Laodiceans. Okay, so according to some early traditions, uh, there are some scholars that believe this. The German theologian Adolf von Harnack uh, says early copies may have suppressed Laodicea due to, due to the bad press it received from Jesus. Remember in Revelation 3. Paul does mention a letter to Laodiceans in Colossians 4.16, but uh, this could be an attempt to locate that letter in this one because this doesn't have a two address. So there are all kinds of, uh, you know, um, debates and arguments about where the destination is. Uh, and one very popular theory is a Laodicean uh, destination which we looked at. Uh, but in effect, uh, there is a larger body of scholars that believe, and for good reasons, that this is a circular letter. Uh, now, back in my days, you know, when somebody had to uh, pass on an important information, let's say in school or in the workplace, they would send a courier, you know, uh, some, somebody that worked uh, in the admin department in the school or college or the workplace, and they will carry uh, a letter and uh, uh, that is called as a circular uh, now of course with intranet and email and uh, you know uh, whatnot we don't see this happen but here yeah, this letter uh, scholars believe is most likely a circular letter addressed to various churches in the vicinity of ephesus i'll show you where ephesus is in a bit so it's a circular destination and uh, that explains the omission uh, of a named city in the two address. If a single copy of the letter circulated or originated from Ephesus and came back uh, completing one full circle uh, to Ephesus, the name of that city would easily have become linked to that letter. And perhaps that's how this came to be called as a letter to the Ephesians, right? Now, this is, uh, let the picture load. This is, oh, the map is not loading yet. Give me a minute. Okay, anyway, as the map loads, let's uh, do a little bit of uh, efficient trivia. Yeah, so, so you see Asia, you see Galatia in purple, and uh, in red, Okay, within Asia is the city of Ephesus. It is a port city. So it is actually the capital of the Roman proconsular Asia. Okay, and uh, it was situated on a plain near the mouth of the river Kester, which uh, where met the Aegean Sea. It was originally a Greek colony. And that's important for us to understand. Ephesus was a commercial city a political and religious center as well. So it's an important city. As a major trading center, most port cities are trading centers, Ephesus ranked with Alexandria in importance and Antioch. So we're talking about an important city. We're talking about the capital of a Roman uh, province. Uh, we're talking about a commercial uh, trade city, a political and religious center. Uh, only third to Alexandria and Antioch, right? Now, what's uh, uh, important about this uh, in terms of their uh, spirituality? Now, the Ephesians worshipped goddess Diana uh, or Artemis. Diana is the Roman name. Artemis is the Greek name. The pagan temple of Diana was located in Ephesus. Her image was a many-breasted mummy-like figure of oriental uh, symbolism, right? Okay, yes. Her famous temple was a Greek building of the iconic order. It was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world because of its vast dimensions. I'll show you how big uh, it was. Costly material used, extended colonnades, numerous statues and paintings, and accumulated wealth. Okay, so this was a buzzing temple city as well. The city of Ephesus considered itself the temple sweeper or warden, uh, uh, referred to as Neokoros, the servant of the great goddess, right? 
but there's a lot of importance associated to this. Somehow, I think the pictures are taking some time to load. Now, this is a picture I want to show you, yes, of the Temple uh, of Artemis. This is, of course, uh, a reconstruction, uh, an artist's reconstruction of the Temple of Artemis, a massive structure on an elevation, uh, numerous colonnades, uh, expensive material that was used, a lot of trade around this particular temple, okay? But uh, much of this is gone. And uh, I'll let this load. This is how it looks today. Okay, thank you. Yes, this is how it looks today. Absolutely in shambles, in ruins. I don't even think that uh, so many of these colonnades are anymore there. Uh, this is a picture which is a little dated. Uh, uh, and uh, recent pictures have almost nothing left of uh, the Temple of Artemis. Right, so uh, New Testament Pauline epistles, chronological overview. If you're getting kind of confused, we have already seen Romans. Uh, we have uh, studied one and two Corinthians. We have studied Galatians. And uh, just for you to have a kind of a framework in the back of your head when we keep talking about Pauline epistles in chronological order, the first one that was perhaps written was one and two Thessalonians. Yeah, that come, comes later on in the Bible. Uh, then uh, the second set that was written was uh, written were 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and Romans, which is what we uh, have finished studying already. And uh, during his first imprisonment, mm, uh, scholars say Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and the Philippians. There are some scholars that believe that Paul wrote uh, Ephesians in a second imprisonment, but that's uh, uh, getting into technicalities. Let's not uh, uh, go there yet beyond the scope of the study. And finally, in his second imprisonment, some people believe that he uh, wrote his pastoral epistles to his spiritual sons, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and uh, Titus. Okay. So the first set of letters are looking at the coming of the Lord, uh, eschatology, because, you know, uh, people were anticipating the second coming of the Lord. The second set of letters that he writes during the third missionary journey is speaking about the uniqueness of Jesus and the work of Jesus, finished work of Jesus on the cross, so theology. Uh, and uh, the first Roman imprisonment, he writes about high Christology about Christ, and uh, finally he writes about uh, church conduct and uh, church affairs in ecclesiology, right? So roughly, when was this letter written? This, this letter was roughly written uh, between 60 to 62 uh, AD, right? I'm trying to pull that slide up. Yes, okay, uh, 60 to 62 AD. There are some that uh, uh, date it uh, very tight. I think 60 to 62 is uh, a, a kind of a safe dating for us, right? And uh, this is a beautiful table by Charles Calls, uh, sorry, uh, Charles Swindle. Uh, why are my pictures taking a lot of time to load? Oh. Okay, mm. yeah, so this is a, a lovely uh, overview of uh, the episode of the Ephesians. I shared this in our WhatsApp group uh, before we started reading it. So chapters one to three is divided into, into, into uh, one section. Chapters four to six in another section. Uh, one to three, our uh, emphasis is primarily doctrinal. So it speaks about the vertical relationship with God. Chapters four to six is uh, practical and uh, speaks about praxis and not just dogma. And it speaks about the horizontal relationship that Christians ought to have with others. All right. You can uh, take a closer look at this later on. We have much ground to cover. 
And so I'm moving on. This is another beautiful uh, overview chart, which you can study. These are uh, the attempts of different authors to kind of look for structure and to systematize this beautiful uh, episode, okay? And we are quickly moving into exegeting efficiency. And this is when I want all of you to pick your Bibles up and turn to Ephesians 1. And we'll be quickly looking at uh, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And I hope to do that in the next uh, yeah, 20, 25 minutes or so, right? All right, so chapter 1. Uh, I have uh, given this uh, a theme uh, called heavenly blessings, okay? So chapter one uh, predominantly speaks about heavenly blessings. It has a doxology of race, Ephesians uh, 3 to 14, the first half. And it has thanksgiving and prayer, 15 to 23. Now this is very unusual and uh, to devote an entire chapter, uh, to praise God, uh, devote about uh, 10 to 11 verses to praise God, and another uh, eight to uh, seven to eight verses to uh, give thanks to God and to pray for the, uh, you know, churches in the Ephesian region. So Paul doesn't uh, do it so extensively, but here he does this very extensively. He's taking a lot of time to get into the letter, as it were. So. Uh, when we look at uh, the first section, we Paul makes an appeal to the choosing of the father. He seems to be focusing on uh, the past plan. And uh, when we look at the next section, he is focusing on the son who is, uh, you know, the redeemer, uh, who well, he's speaking about a present provision. And when we look at the next section, uh, he is speaking about the spirit, which is the seal, which is the promised future, right? Okay. Issues. Loading. Okay, sun, present provision, and the spirit sealed, which is the promised future. Sure. Okay, so let me go back. So we are speaking, we are looking at verses uh, three to six. I'm going to read it. The insertions, the uh, letters in black, uh, are directly from the pages of the Bible. So, uh, okay, you're at the long slide. And I'm really sorry about this. Yeah, there seems to be a lack, right? So we are speaking, looking at verses 3 to 6. I'm going to read that. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So Paul is speaking about uh, spiritual blessedness. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. He speaks about the choosing, which is the creation. To be holy and blameless in his sight, he's speaking of a justification. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. He's speaking of uh, being predestined in love to be adopted as sons in accordance with his pleasure and will. The purposes for which we were predestined in love and adopted to sonship was for the pleasure and the will of God to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us. In the one he loves. Okay, so he's speaking of grace freely given. Given, He's speaking of unmerited favor. He's speaking of a glorious grace, right? So he's in this first part speaking about the father's choosing, which is the past plan of God. Okay. Now we move on to the son's redeeming in the next section. The sun's redeeming in the next section. Verse 7, uh, follow in your Bibles. In him we have redemption through his blood. So he's speaking of the redemptive power of the blood of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins. He's speaking of the redemptive power to forgive sins. 
in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. So he's speaking again about grace, unmerited favor, and speaking about a surplus uh, uh, lavishing of grace without any restraint, without any holding back. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery. So there has been a mystery in the past, which is getting revealed in the present uh, through the person of Jesus Christ, of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, at the fulfillment of time. Okay, so God always does things at the right time. Somebody said uh, he's to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth, the purpose for which this mystery is revealed is to bring unity, uh, to unite all things under what? Under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we looked at the Father in the, uh, in the past doing something. We are looking at the Son in the present doing something. And now we're moving to the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the future, okay, that is uh, that would do something in the present that would secure us a future. So 11 to 14 speaks about in him, we were also chosen. So there is this idea of choosing again, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So everything gets predestined according to the will of the father in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, first to hope in Christ, uh, indicating the Jews, might be for the praise of his glory. Why? Why did they put their hope in Christ? For his praise, for his glory. And you also were included in Christ, speaking of the Gentiles, when you heard the message of truth. Okay, so you were included when you hear, heard. So hearing is an important theme. Uh, you know, if the gospel has to reach somebody, that person has to have somebody who can help him hear. The gospel of your salvation. So when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Now, this is very important. So at the moment of believing, uh, believers are sealed. Sealed with what? The promised Holy Spirit, who is like a deposit the token deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, until the redemption of the rest of those that are not in God's fold yet. And why all of this? To the praise of his glory. So here, uh, the Holy Spirit happens to be the seal, uh, the Holy the Spirit of God that comes into us at conversion is like a token deposit guaranteeing our future inheritance, uh, which will happen until all the others that need to get saved would get saved and all of this for the glory of God, right? So if somebody is uh, discouraged as you are listening to this, has gone through a difficult week, as Priscilla prayed, I think Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 is a passage for you to really, really lap up because it speaks about our identity, our true identity in Jesus. Regardless of what the world seems to be calling us, regardless of what you yourself are thinking about yourself, uh, you know, we can glean beautiful nuggets to gold about our true identity in Jesus from Ephesians 3 to 14. I am blessed with all spiritual blessings. I am chosen by God. I am a child of God. I am highly favored. I am forgiven completely. I am included in God's plan. I am an heir of God. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit for a future day of redemption for his glory. Amazing. Isn't it amazing? Right? So this is a beautiful passage. And this is an important slide that you might want to go through on a daily basis. You know, if there are thoughts that bother you, uh, that belittle you, and that you don't think you don't measure up, but in Christ Jesus, this is your true identity and efficiency, right? Moving on, uh, verse 17 onwards. Uh, thanksgiving and prayer. So we have finished the first section, which is the doxology section. And now we are moving to thanks, which is a praise to God. 
and now we are moving to this section called thanksgiving and prayer oh, again it's not loading give me a second right somebody says there is a huge lag i'm so sorry about that uh I don't think we can right now. Let's let's just get going. Okay, as long as you can hear me, uh, don't bother too much about the slides not flowing. Uh, Thanksgiving and prayer, verse 17 to 23. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now, it's important for us to uh, know God Okay, uh, that's at one level, but it's also very paramount that we know him better. So I have said better know him, which is salvation, know him better, which is sanctification and glorification. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Okay, and uh, Paul is speaking in the context of impending persecution under Nero, that's going to unfold in another couple of years. So he's speaking about the hope, okay, that people uh, that have embraced Jesus need to know. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So know the hope. First is know him. Second, know the hope. Third, know the riches. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. So know the power. So when we know him, we ought to know his hope. We ought to know the riches of his glorious inheritance that we have stored in him. And we ought to know his power as well. And that power that Paul speaks about here is the same as the mighty strength. He exerted when he raised uh, Christ from the dead, which is resurrection power, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So it's speaking of a power which is a resurrecting power, speaking of a power which is a reinstating power, speaking of a power which is a restorative power. So he says, this is the kind of power that we, puny, weak believers who have trusted Jesus to be Lord and Savior, actually do possess in Jesus. Okay. And so he's kind of exhorting and encouraging them to face persecution when it comes far far above all rule and authority power and dominion and every name that is invoked not only in the present age but also in the one to come so he is speaking of uh, a transcendent eternal power so it's a power that can resurrect it's a power that can reinstate it's a power that can restore it's a power that is transcendent and it is also an eternal power. And he's thanking God and he's praying for the efficient uh, churches in the efficient vicinity. And God placed all things under his feet. He's speaking of subordination, subjugation to Christ and appointed him to be head over everything. He's speaking of supraordination for the church, which is his body. And this is when he introduces this big bomb idea that the church is his body, okay? Later, he calls this as a, uh, a mystery. We'll come to that uh, in chapter two or three. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way speaks about the sufficiency or fullness of Christ. So Paul in chapter one is praising God uh, profusely. He is thanking God. He's encouraging the believers that are you know, about to face persecution. And he is praying and, uh, you know, really pumping hope into them and motivating and speaking of their riches, their identity, their power that they have in Jesus Christ to continue to be steadfast in faith. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Ephesians chapter 2, two, uh, uh, two and 3, actually, Divine Grace. I've titled this as Divine Grace. This entire section is devoted to what is called as Divine Grace. So again, follow through in your Bibles. 
as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. He starts off saying that you are ungodly people in which you used to live and you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit which is now at work in those who are disobedient. Who are the disobedient? The followers of evil, not us anymore. All of us also lived among them at one time. Okay. Uh, so we were also like that. So somehow don't think of yourself as a holy Joe. Paul was again speaking here of another big theme, which is unity between Jews and Gentiles in the church. So he's saying all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thought. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Deserving of punishment. So don't be too high headed now, is what he's saying. But because of his great love for us, he's pitching it at the right place. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ undeservedly, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Okay, Billy Graham is famous to have, uh, you know, to finish his. Uh, evangelistic meetings uh, with an altar call and during which time uh, this beautiful hymn, Just As I Am, would be played. So just as I am, we all came to Christ dead in our transgressions. We didn't have to clean up. We didn't have to do anything because Christ did all of that for us. The big distinction between Christianity and every other world religion or faith is Christianity says done. And all the other world religions and faith say, do this and do such and such to be even able to approach God. But we came dead in our transgressions. So again, he goes on and says, it is by grace you have to play one of the important uh, solas or the five solas of reformation. And God raised us up with Christ. And seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Divinely positioned. Okay, it speaks of a divine positioning. Right? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It speaks about glorification. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is a classic word. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. So la fide, that is the second sola. And this is not from yourself. You didn't do anything worthy of it. It's undeserved. It is the gift of God. Uh, not by works. Therefore, it is unmerited so that no one can boast. So here we find in this little uh, episode tucked away in, in a corner, you know, the tenets of uh, the Reformation uh, movement, right? And, uh, and then it goes on to say, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works after having been saved, right? So good works are a consequence of salvation. Good works don't lead to salvation. That's an important distinction which God prepared in advance for us to do. And uh, in other words, we are God's workmanship waiting to display God's power in and through our lives, right? Then we move on to verses 11 to 16. It speaks about uh, unity. And Paul seems to be going uh, really, really deliberately on no more divisions. So therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves a circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, who is he addressing? He is addressing, like we studied in the book of Galatians, the cult of Judaizers, Judaizers. So there was a group of people that went from Jerusalem, Jews that uh, apparently said they trusted in Jesus as Messiah, but they wanted a version of Jesus plus, and that plus was Jesus plus circumcision, Jesus plus Jewish feast days, Jesus plus Jewish uh, food loss. Okay. And uh, so Paul is speaking against them at this point in time. Remember that, verse 12, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. They're saying without hope. 
is to be without God. Now, if you're without God in the world as an atheist, definitely there is nothing for you to hold on to as hope. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Again, the importance of the blood through the blood. We have been brought near. The blood, blood is our propitiation, the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. So who is Jesus? He is our peacemaker who has made the two groups one. So don't be in conflict anymore. He is the one that has brought these two together through his blood. And you don't be uh, biting and spitting at each other. And uh, because Jesus is the peacemaker and he is the one who is also the barrier breaker, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier. He's divided the wall of hostility. And so you don't be busy building walls. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. So he's the law fulfiller. All right. He's speaking, giving titles to Jesus. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. This is again a very big idea that Paul is introducing in chapter two. Okay. Uh, the first one, of course, is that the body of Christ, the church. The second one is uh, salvation by grace alone, faith alone, not by our works. The third big idea is one new humanity. Okay. Uh, uh, breaking away the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, which is the ministry of reconciliation, by which he put to death their hostility. So we are speaking about the peacemaker Jesus, the barrier breaker Jesus, the law fulfiller Jesus, the uniter Jesus, uh, the reconciler Jesus, uh, the one that ends uh, hostility even through his death. So Paul says, if this is what Jesus' work has entailed, and uh, he did all of that, right? Even at the cost of being put to death, and through his death, all of this has been achieved, there is definitely no reason for you to have any more divisions between Jew and Gentile, right? Then <clears throat> we move on to the next... Uh, bit of verses where he speaks about temple and body temple and body verse 17 he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near for through him we both have access to the father by one spirit so he's speaking of a relationality and uh, is speaking of uh, the idea of the trinity comes beautifully in verse 18 if you are looking at it and looking carefully for it for through him, through who? Through Jesus, we have access to the Father by one Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The talking of uh, the representation of the Trinitarian formula in this verse. Trinitarian interrelatedness of perichoresis. Verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. So you've become a citizen now, and not just that. He goes on to say, you've also become a member of the family of God, a member of God's household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. Again, he speaks of the primacy of Christ. Okay, That Christ is the crux, Christ is the center, Christ is the numero uno, Christ is the chief cornerstone. Christ is the capstone. Christ is the important foundation stone. In him, the whole building, which is a church, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So it speak, uh, speaks of the temple and uh, connecting with, with the idea of the body of Christ. And in the next verse, uh, interestingly, just the flip up of what happens in verse 21 happens in verse 22. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So in verse 21, temple, body of Christ. Here, 22, body, temple of God. Right? Temple is a body of Christ. Here, your body is the temple of God. And to the Jews, 
the temple was the center of their civilization okay everything revolved around the temple and here if your body is equated to the temple of god paul will speak about the importance of holiness of uh, the temple of god which is our body in the ensuing chapters and verses Right, let's move now to chapter three. Chapter three speaks about uh, a mystery unveiled, which I told you in chapter one. And I'm not going to uh, uh, read this uh, entirely, just for want of time. I have another three chapters to uh, make up for. So the mystery unveiled, what is that mystery? The mystery is also called as a mystery of Christ. And uh, verse five says, which was not made known to people in other generations. So the idea of revelation being progressive is what I want you to emphasize here uh, and, and, and pick up. Verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. So this mystery is not that Jesus is the savior of the world. Uh, that is mysterious uh, in itself. But the mystery that he speaks here in this letter is that the savior of the world, uh, you know, is indeed not just the savior of the Jews, but also the savior of the Gentiles. And the great mystery that is revealed at the right time through the person work of Jesus is that the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel and we are one new humanity, one new humanity, one new humanity. That is his chorus. That is his theme in this entire uh, you know, episode, right? One new humanity, body of Christ, the church, right? And uh, salvation by grace alone, faith alone, not by works, but for works. Let's look at the next section, uh, verses 7 onwards. So I've called this a church, access, uh, and encouragement. So Paul now goes into details about the church. And uh, he calls the church as an instrument which is purposed for the display of God's wisdom. So when you're thinking of church, you're thinking of the body of Christ. And now Paul is saying, when you're thinking of the church, think of the body of Christ. But also think of the body displaying God's wisdom. So in our modern churches, okay, the church can be a real, real witness to the world if the church is done right. If the people of the world are looking at the church in the members of the church, they will see the body of Christ. Christ in power, in position, in unity, in love, in community. And they should also see, according to Paul's argument, God's wisdom emanating through the church, right? And he also speaks of a Christ and faith in Christ as our two requisites for access to God. Verse 12, he says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. How do we go to God in prayer? How do we relate with God? How do we commune with God? How do we become intense and intimate with God? Primarily through the person of Christ and faith in the person and the finished work of Christ. That is what gives us freedom. That is what gives us confidence in relating with God. Okay, so if we are thinking that, you know, uh, you know, our intimacy with God needs to be tweaked a little bit. This is a verse that you have to probably, uh, you know, dissect and think of mull over. And uh, 13, he says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged. Again, he is coming to, you know, the backdrop of persecution, impending persecution about to be unfurled because Paul himself was a persecutor. And so uh, he knows how intense persecution can be. And he is now on the other side of persecution. And he is telling his spiritual children not to be discouraged. Okay, not to be discouraged. I am in chains already. I am an ambassador in chains. But don't look at me and be discouraged. Do not be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. 
So he's encouraging amidst persecution and that speaks so much of a pastoral uh, and a Christ centered heart and life, right? So then uh, there is another repetition of what happens in chapter one. So chapter one had doxology and prayer. Chapter three again has a second doxology and prayer. This is very, very interesting. Paul generally doesn't write this way and uh, it's very interesting. And he says in verse 14, for this reason, which reason? Persecution. So what is a pastor doing when he is going through persecution and when he is afraid that his spiritual children might, you know, uh, face the brunt of persecution? He says, I kneel before the father. He's saying, I pray for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name from whom. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. He's got a lot of riches, people, you know, uh, health, wealth, prosperity preachers take these verses out of context. And when glorious riches are spoken about, they are thinking of health, wealth and material prosperity. But here Paul speaks about God has glorious riches and out of that glorious riches, what is most essential and important for the church today that is going through persecution is that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. Where? In your inner being. So he's praying for inner power as a pastor who's in chains. Then in verse 17, he's praying for perseverance. Okay, this, this is a template of a pastoral prayer, a pastor that is in chains. Then third, uh, not for himself, but for his congregation. Then uh, in verse uh, 17 again, he says, praying for rootedness in love. So praying for inner power, praying for perseverance, praying for rootedness in love. And verse 18, look at the highlighted section, praying for grasping. Okay, uh, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Praying for understanding of God's love. Okay, of course, it's unfathomable, but uh, praying uh, for grasping power to understand the riches of God's love. How wide and long and high and deep. Verse 19, he says, praying for relational knowing. So there are two types of knowing people. We can know God, which is relational knowing, intimate knowing. We can know about God, which is intellectual knowing. Can we mute our mics, please? Yeah, thank you. And to know uh, <clears throat> this love that surpasses knowledge, praying for relational knowing that transcends intellectual knowing. Then he is uh, praying to be filled to the fullness, right? Praying to be filled the fullness of God, full measure of God. Again, he says, <clears throat> our prayers are not answered according to the list that we submit to God. Our prayers are always answered according to his power, right? So if somebody's prayer is working, don't think the prayer warrior is a powerful prayer warrior or the prayer is an eloquent prayer. The prayer could even be just a tear. The prayer could even be just a silent, uh, you know, few words that are clumsily phrased and coined. So a prayers are answered according to his power and his purpose. And then again, he goes into a beautiful, uh, you know, ending of praise to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Right, so that's the second doxology, and we have moved to unity and diversity again. Chapters four, very quickly. How are we doing on time? We have another five minutes. Let me try and rush them. Okay, unity, which is our prescription. So Paul is saying in chapters four, five, and six about Christian living. In chapters one to three, he is giving doctrines, he's giving dogmas, he's giving principles. Okay, that's like the theory. Okay, we are speaking of uh, theoretical physics and practical physics. Okay, that's the theory part. This is where the rubber meets the road, chapters four, five, and six. Uh, he speaks about unity in, in, in big terms. Okay, look at all of the highlighted portions, right? And before he starts off, he says, uh, this is my credibility. 
Okay, therefore you can believe what I'm saying and what's my credibility? I'm in prison for the faith. Well, that means I know what I'm saying, that I've suffered for the faith and what I, what I speak from where I am uh, is credible and you need to give heed to it, right? Then he speaks about humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Does it sound like the fruit of the spirit that we studied in Galatians two weeks back? Yes, it does. And he speaks again of pursuing unity, practicing peace. Then he goes on into this very classic verse, uh, you know, where he says, uh, chapter four, verse four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So every time we hear one, 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 we are thinking, oh, it has to be done once. It has to be done once. Many people have this confusion. Oh, he speaks of one baptism. My parents, you know, baptized me as an infant. Now, taking adult baptism would be against this verse. No, he's speaking about uh, unity. Okay, there is one body, idea of unity. There is one spirit, idea of unity. There is one hope, idea of unity. There is one Lord, idea of unity. One faith, idea of unity. One baptism. Uh, idea of unity, one God, idea of unity, Father, unity in our belonging, okay, was overall authority through all agency and in all, which is presence, right? So he's speaking about the unity of the faith, the unity of the faith in different aspects. Then here he speaks about what is called as a portion grace, a, appropriate call. Now, many of us are very talented, many of us are very gifted, and we think that we can run the church or a ministry all by ourselves with our multiple and varied giftings. But here, Paul has something else to say. He says, no, that is not how it works. He says, you know, uh, in verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ saw fit. So there are different measures of grace that are apportioned to us. Not because God is partial, but in his wisdom, he sees that we can handle so much. And so he speaks about the different offices of the church. He speaks about a diversity of roles. He speaks about diversity in giftings. He speaks about diversity in responsibilities. And he says all of this is to equip and edify the church. And he speaks of this diversity in office, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, five offices, all right? And he says all this diverse calling and ministerial gifting is actually to produce unity. So the idea of unity in diversity. Now, Christians uh, need to be united, but we don't have to be uniform. We are not clones of each other, all right? And uh, so he goes on and he says, what unites us actually, what unites us is maturity in faith and knowledge is what unites us. So when we all come to the same level of maturity in faith and knowledge, then our differences in understanding, you know, uh, the person of God and the work of God and the ways of God uh, are, are not very varied, right? And so he's speaking about uh, our goal, which is the fullness of Christ. Then he goes on to speak about maturity, benefits of maturity. Uh, so he says maturity gives stability. Maturity helps us to be discerning. He says, uh, in, uh, he says maturity will also give you the ability to uh, marry truth and grace uh, in a very balanced way. We see in the Gospels that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. Now, grace and truth seem very uh, opposed to each other. So maturity in faith will give us the ability to be truthful and at the same time uh, gracious. Right. And he goes on and he says, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body. Now imagine a caricature of Jesus Christ, Jesus with big eyes, Jesus with big nose, you know, puny little legs and uh, very weak arms. Okay, so that's that's the caricature, certain body parts are, you know, 
disproportionate. But maturity, Paul says, will not make a caricature of Jesus, will not make a caricature of the church. And all of us would have grown proportionately. The head and the eyes and the nose and the hands and the feet. And, you know, so that's what he's speaking of. Unity in diversity. Uh, very quickly, uh, he speaks about holy conduct. And I like to call this as the efficient beatitudes, not the beatitudes, the be attitudes, right? So uh, the first one is, he says, be different, okay? Be different behavior, be different from the people of the world. And he says, you, are, uh, you, you, you put off your old self, you are made new and you put on your new self, okay? And because of which you're in right standing and being set apart from the world, therefore you ought to be different in the way you talk and you walk. If you don't, that means there has not been any transformatory work that has happened in your life. So first one is be different. The second one is uh, be Christian. Sorry, I'm rushing a bit. Uh, but these are very, very easy portions, uh, nothing very theologically deep. And But life application principles, there's a lot to glean from. The PowerPoints would be shared on the group. And please take time to go through the highlighted portions. And uh, so the second one, first one is be different. The second one is be Christian. Okay. Uh, in the likeness of God, each one of you must put off. Okay. So putting on, putting off, putting on, putting off. You know, that idea keeps coming. So put off falsehood, which means you have to put on truthfulness, right? And he speaks of anger and uh, he uh, kind of differentiates anger into two. One is anger that leads to sin. So which means there is a retributive anger, there is restorative anger. I have an eight-year-old and many times uh, she does something mischievous. As a parent, you get angry, you know, with what she's doing, but you can be uh, angry in a very restorative way so that that child will see what is wrong and will come around. But if you're retributive in your anger, you want to punish, you want to flog, you want to beat up to pulp and, you know, you don't care about restoration, that's retributive anger. So Paul speaks about the two distinctions because he says anger could and does give a foothold to the devil in all matters of uh, life, right? And he speaks about money. Uh, Galatians, we saw a lot about money uh, and giving. He says, easy money is lazy money. Okay, verse 28. And he says, labored money is legit money. Easy money, lazy money, labored money, legit money. Right? And he says, uh, money, blessed money, is that money that becomes a blessing to many. Okay, he speaks of blessed money in verse 28 which has to uh, become a blessing to many. Only then it is blessed. He speaks about uh, watching our tongue, which James speaks uh, a lot uh, about. So nothing unwholesome should come out of our lips. Only things that are edifying, only things that are beneficial. And he says, don't let your conduct grief, grieve the spirit of God. And he, in verse 32, gives a virtue list. Oftentimes, Paul gives a vice list. Here he gives a virtue list. Very quickly, give me uh, another six minutes. I'll finish uh, with that. Sorry about that. He speaks of being fatherlike. So be uh, different, be Christian, be fatherlike, right? Chapter five. Like father, like children, self effacing love, okay? And he says, not even a hint of sexual immorality. Uh, not even any kind of impurity, he says, because these are improper, okay, uh, which are not our place. Uh, and he goes on uh, to say uh, in verse 5, for of this you can be sure, what can be uh, you be sure of? No immoral, impure, greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, okay? Why? An immoral person worships himself because he has his own moral law. Second, an impure person worships the object that causes him to become impure. Okay? Uh, and a greedy person worships what doesn't belong to him. 
So all these three categories are making idols of their own and worshipping those idols. That's why these three categories are called as idolaters. And uh, finally, he says, therefore, do not be partners with people that are, you know, uh, deceptive talkers. He says, just stay away from them. Okay. Stay away from them. Then be light like. So the idea of light to a Hebrew, uh, to a Jew is a big light, uh, uh, is a big thing. And Paul is speaking about how we are the light of the world now, like Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus said that you are the light of the world. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to leave this uh, for want of time. And then there are more Beatitudes that you can check out very quickly. I'm going to come to this important section on Christian homes. Submission, reverence, and love. Submission, reverence, and love. Mutual submission. It's, it's an image of Trinitarian model. It's an idea of relationality that is practiced between the members of the Trinity. So he's speaking of submission to one another. Uh, church in a generic sense and in a specific sense, family slash marriage. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. So he's speaking of us submitting to one another. Second, he speaks about uh, wife submitting to husband in the Lord. Again, why? Out of reverence, out of love, out of respect, out of trust. Now, if the wife has to submit to the husband, then the husband has to be worthy of reverence, worthy of love, worthy of respect, and earn trust, right? And uh, verse 23 speaks about the husband not being an overbearing head, okay, but a self-effacing head like Jesus Christ. Now, if the man is such, then it is very easy for the woman to submit to him out of reverence, love, respect, and trust. Now, husbands love your wife. He's speaking about sacrificial love, giving your all type of love to make the church a holy church. Jesus did this. So Paul says, just like how Jesus did, you know, uh, whatever he did to sanctify the church, you are supposed to do for your spouse, your wife. You're supposed to be the spiritual head, spiritually investing in your wife's transformation. And you cannot expect that if you yourself are not transformed, right? And uh, love and respect, important. They complement each other. They complement each other, okay? And uh, so husband is supposed to love the wife uh, and wife is supposed to respect the husband. A woman uh, is wired uh, to be satisfied when love is given to her. A husband is wired to be satisfied uh, when respect is given to him. So love and respect, what each other uh, expect of each other, should complement each other to produce more love and more respect right now the last slide the children parents and then interestingly he moves on to slaves and masters right so he speaks about obedience he speaks about moral standard he speaks about honor he's he's giving a beautiful secret about longevity if any of you listening wants to live long you know uh, uh, you know like the royal family they're all dying at 98 and 101 and all of that uh, the secret to longevity is that we would honor our parents, okay? And fathers, importantly, if there are fathers hearing, uh, uh, speaks to me as well. Uh, uh, don't uh, irritate your children. Don't provoke your children to anger. Don't annoy your children. Some of us have this habit of doing all of that, right? Uh, but we are supposed to train and instruct uh, in a redemptive, restorative way. So he speaks about bond servants that are slaves, not slaves like we imagine the slave traders and slaves in uh, America and all of that. Uh, this is an idea of a servant that is signed up to serve in a particular family all their life or for seven years or whatever. Okay, so, uh, so slave, uh, he's your caretaker, benefactor, master, and therefore slaves work with integrity. Uh, slaves of Christ serve wholeheartedly. God is the ultimate rewarder and God is the ultimate master. And uh, we have a common, impartial, eternal master, whether we are uh, slaves or we are earthly masters, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, armor of God. This is something that uh, we are very familiar with. And I'm not going to uh, beat this uh, further. 
in the armor of God, truth, righteousness, God, gospel of faith, the uh, gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. But what gets neglected often is keep on praying, keep on praying. Okay, prayer is that uh, weapon uh, that is important for us to stand our ground in Christ and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. We are on war mode. We are on quote unquote what today people call as beast mode. Uh, be prepared. Be prepared. Always keep on praying. Okay. Thank you so much. And very very sorry about uh, eating a lot of your time. If uh, we have any questions, we can take that. Sure. Thank you, Charles. Now we have a question here. Uh, the chat. Was I have a question regarding the anointing of the Holy Spirit. As per the mm -hmm. Bible verse, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The moment we believe in Christ, so is this called anointing of the Holy Spirit or is that different? Because some churches emphasize that Christians or believers pray to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Is that necessary since that is that necessary since the way is the we are already seen the, by the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, very it's a very beautiful question. My point. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, important question. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding around the word anointing. And uh, many people use the word anointing, which is a heavy uh, Old Testament word, very flippantly in modern church today especially in uh, charismatic and Pentecostal circles. Uh, the idea of anointing is to take uh, an, an element, which could either be oil or water or whatever, and pour over the head of somebody that is going to be commissioned to uh, a, an exclusive work of the Lord, as the Lord has called him or her, right? Now, in the New Testament, all of us are called to be, uh, are referred to as royal priests, right? So there is a priesthood of all believers in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, certain people were anointed for certain tasks by God, okay? The king was anointed, the priest was anointed, the Levites were anointed, and so on. So, so anointing basically means uh, to pour oil uh on you, holy oil on a person and uh, consecrate that person for a sacred task or duty. Okay. Now, there are many people that use this word anointing of the Holy Spirit in very different ways in the modern church. And uh, I'm clueless about uh, how all they are using it, but I'm sufficiently knowledgeable that they are not using it in the proper biblical way and context. Right. And uh, so the word anointing that is used, uh, anointed by the Holy Spirit, even when Priscilla prayed uh, uh, tonight, uh, she said, Lord, anoint him, you know. Uh, so that's a word uh, that all of us use, uh, sometimes very, uh, uh, you know, not, not too carefully, not too thoughtfully, right? So I've given you the Old Testament idea of anointing. Now, the anointing by the Holy Spirit, if a modern person is using, uh, first of all, Paul is saying in Romans and, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians again, and even today, uh, about us, you know, being saved by the regeneration of our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now, no Christian can be saved or can technically be calling himself as a Christian, a uh, believer in Jesus Christ, person and finished work, unless his heart has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. So technically, all of us that continue to follow Jesus' as disciples have been worked upon by the Holy Spirit. Paul also speaks here and elsewhere about we becoming a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in every believer is a biblical reality. Now, where it gets blurred is, uh, you know, around, uh, you know, certain passages that are used as proof texts and taken out of context, 
where especially the book of Acts, where there seems to clearly be uh, another kind of an experience, not just the conversion justification experience, the starting of salvation, but also another kind of experience of filling by the Holy Spirit that we see in the New Testament church, specifically in the book of Acts, time and time and time again. Now, if you can go back to our Acts study and uh, sit and listen to that, I think some of your confusions would be clarified. So uh, at this moment, I would like to say that at salvation, everybody has been a recipient of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates our heart and continues to indwell our hearts and we become a temple of the Holy Spirit. But is that all there is to it? Perhaps there is something more. Some will argue that it is something more only in the book of Acts and that it is not there for the modern church. But that's for another day. It can be a debate. But the book of Acts speaks about another kind of an experience with the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, which I don't want to call anointing because of the, uh, you know, misuse of this term anointing. So I've given you what anointing historically is from the Old Testament, how anointing is misused in the New Testament, how all of us are possessors of the Holy Spirit as believers. But I'm also referring you to the book of Acts to look at the ideas of an infilling of the Holy Spirit that seems to be. Uh, another experience. So, uh, but each of us coming from different denominations, reading the Bible from different, uh, you know, glasses might come to different conclusions. But uh, this is all I want to say for now. Maybe we can take this further, God willing, next year when we do doctrinal studies, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, I'm also thinking of. Uh, but for now, I think it's good for us to park it here and continue to keep thinking about it yeah thank you thank you Charlson. Charlson, i have a personal question as we uh, read in the book of ephesians chapter 6 we read about the putting on the uh, armor. Uh, armor of the god, armor of god so yeah. and also it, it says about uh, you know whenever we think about the armor of god uh, mm -hmm. usually we get a picture of uh, you know um, having wrestling with the satan or about the satanic attack or uh, mm -hmm. so and so. So my question is like, uh, mm -hmm. does uh, God, uh, you know, that, does Satan have to get God's permission before he can attack uh, anyone or really Satan attack someone or why does God even allow Satan to attack a believer as we read in the, uh, I mean, for an example, we can take the life of Job. So... Can you just put some mm -hmm. thoughts about the uh, satanic attack or a spiritual warfare, especially? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, lots of uh, lots of questions there, and uh, some very good uh, questions as well. Uh, Aditya, I think uh, if uh, as believers we uh, we do not uh, have a theology uh, that includes Satan and the spiritual forces of darkness. Uh, our theology will be very lopsided. But the danger uh, is that some people uh, really are so obsessed about uh, the demonology and that they take it to, uh, uh, you know, undue, uh, you know, undue places and give it undue importance. C.S. Lewis says that there has to be a balance between whether there is the demonic world and spiritual forces of darkness and how much of attention and weightage that we give it to it, we give to it. And also he says there will be an equal error if we totally neglect the idea of spiritual. So even in this uh, episode, uh, I think in chapters uh, one and two, we are seeing Paul writing about, you know, uh, you know fighting. We're not fighting with flesh and blood. We are engaged in a kind of a spiritual warfare primarily. Those are the primary agents. And there are secondary agents, perhaps humans, that we are fighting with at a physical level. So the idea of the spiritual uh, uh, warfare 
uh, and the physical warfare that a Christian is engaged uh, in has to be understood properly. Primarily, every battle that a Christian fights and faces, uh, you know, spiritual battles uh, to derail us spiritually are uh, coming from, uh, you know, uh, forces of darkness. But to be extra obsessed and be excessively obsessed and uh, be more Satan conscious than to be God conscious is another dangerous position many Christians have gotten themselves to. They even elevate Satan, uh, you know, uh, in their minds uh, as if it is standing against God, uh, pitting and fighting against God as if he were equal. We have to understand that God is always on top, that Satan is a created being, that Satan is limited uh, in knowledge. Satan is limited in his ability to know. Satan cannot read your minds. Okay, he's not omniscient in that way. Satan cannot be in two places at the same time because he is not omnipresent or in all places at the same time. Only God is. Satan is obviously not uh, omnipotent. He doesn't have uh, limitless powers. Only God does. And of course, Satan cannot be and is not omnibenevolent at all because he is the accuser of the brethren. He is the father of lies. He wants to hurt people. He wants to destroy people. He wants people to fall. So I think uh, while as Christians who believe the Bible and who are uh, you know, given to biblical theology, we do uh, recognize uh, the role uh, of Satan and the place of Satan, but we should not give him an undue place in our lives or in our theology or in our minds. Then we will actually be more Satan conscious than being God conscious. And I've seen many Christians that are all the time speaking of only spiritual warfare. And in their minds, they are giving Satan too much of press. So I would suggest that we hold these two in good tension and uh, understand that Satan comes, you know, several categories lower to the idea of God. Is spiritual warfare a reality? Uh, of course, it is a reality. Okay, should we all the time be thinking about spiritual warfare? Well, maybe not. If we have better things to think about and uh, much work to do, uh, you know, and uh, we believe that God is our protector, and we are always on war mode, prayerful all the time, and have all the armor padded up, and we are in a safe place. Okay? We don't have to be obsessed about. When the enemy is coming, I, I remember a beautiful uh, uh, anecdote about Martin Luther. Uh, one night, Martin Luther, when he was sleeping, he uh, woke up in the middle of sleep, and uh, uh, because he could sense that his bed was rattling, okay, the foot end of his bed was, uh, you know, uh, moving uh, violently. The bed was, uh, you know, and he got disturbed. He got up, and uh, he saw a kind of a dark figure. And uh, he looked at it and he said, oh, it's you. And he went back to sleep. Okay. Now, uh, this has stuck with me uh, for a long time. So in a sense, what you understand from this is, yes, of course, Satan is there. Yes, of course, Satan will disturb you. But if you give undue importance and attention to Satan, okay, uh, when are you then going to give importance to God, his work, his people, and you know, the sanctification of our souls and the reaching of the lost and so on. He will come as a barrier. He will come as a disturbance. He could come from time to time. But then we don't get bogged. We don't, uh, uh, you know, respect him so much that we give him too much attention and stop and have a nice conversation uh, or a debate with him. We just have to move heavenwards. We just have to progress. We just have to run. We are pilgrims on a journey. And the barriers will come, spiritual attacks may come, uh, could come, but they have to come uh, only after crossing the layer of God. When you ask, yes, God has to give permission for Satan to do with us whatever he wants to do with us. And if we are secure and safe uh, and walking in right standing with God and not putting our head out of the umbrella, as my pastor in Bombay used to say, we would not get wet. Okay, so we need to know. Our place, its place, our appropriate behavior, 
uh, have the right theology of demonology, have a greater higher view of, uh, you know, of the nature and person of God and Christ and continue to do our work. But are there certain people that are really coming under the attack? Yes, they do. And those people need to probably give it more thought, prayer, bring it to the attention of people in the church and form a team and pray and so on and so forth. So have a healthy balance and uh, stay somewhere in the middle is what I would say. Hello, Thank brother. You. This is Russo. Yes, brother Russo. Yeah. Uh, critics often charge Paul of being a male chauvinist, a racist, racist, and a hypocrite, especially textual oh. critics, because uh, uh, he, why does he want women to submit? Why not men? And uh, why didn't he have the guts to say slavery is sin? And he says, freedom in Christ, but he takes uh, believers to Jerusalem being circumcised. What's your take on it? Okay, lots of questions, Brother Russo. I can't obviously answer all. I'll, I'll uh, definitely take uh, a few of the ones that I remember. Uh, so textual critics say that Paul is such and such. Uh, he's a male chauvinist. He's a racist and uh, he's a hypocrite also and all of that. Uh, now, all of those, all of us that uh, know about textual criticism would know that textual critics are uh, people that are uh, not, uh, you know, so much believing in the inerrancy and uh, infallibility of God's word. They have a kind of a liberal uh, uh, way uh, in which they are looking at the Bible. And uh, uh, for many, Pauline theology is, uh, is something that is very countercultural. And just like how when Jesus came on the scene, he would disturb, you know, uh, everybody that uh, was, uh, was, was, has, had settled for a status quo. Pauline theology is something that all of Paul's episodes, Paul has written about one third of the New Testament, right? Uh, and so, uh, not is it one third yeah maybe even close to half of the uh, new testament so if you are uh, taking some ideas of paul all of these ideas are ideas that are coming to him directly from god as a supernatural revelation special revelation god is superintending what uh, paul receives and paul is faithfully recording it and writing it now, the problem with most people is that they, uh, they say Paul did not go through the school of discipleship that Jesus was, uh, you know, investing in for three and a half years. He comes as somebody, you know, out of nowhere, claims to have met Jesus on the road to Damascus, comes up with all of this profound, you know, uh, quote unquote, uh, out of the box, uh, new theology and new revelation. And so they have a lot of issue with him. Uh, but if we are believing the majesty and authority of the scriptures and how scripture has been divinely inspired by God, superintended by him, but written by faithful men, uh, we are committed to inerrancy and infallibility. And therefore, we have to, okay, uh, we have to uh, grant all of that Paul has recorded as divine revelation. And it is. And uh, Paul is somebody who has had an absolute turnaround from his previous way of life. He is a 180 degree change, overnight kind of a transformed uh, person uh, from being a, 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 a Pharisee of Pharisees persecuting the church. He is now getting persecuted uh, by uh, others. Uh, and he is trying to tell that the gospel has to reach the end of the world, and which means it includes the Gentiles. A Jewish guy going into Gentile territory, becoming an emissary to the Gentiles. So everything about Paul's calling, everything about Paul's uh, epiphany on the road to Damascus, everything about Paul's theology, everything rattles everybody. So that is why many people that are not committed to biblical inerrancy and infallibility, uh, textual critics and liberal theologians have issues with Paul, right? But from whatever Paul has written, we know that all of his writings are backed up with multiple citations from the Old Testament. All of his theology is very well 
well well placed and well thought out and there is an element of divinity and the way he writes the words he writes the coinage of phrases the concepts the allegories everything looks like it just cannot have come from the pen of a mere human alone so granted that paul is of course an endorsed writer by god now why is he doing certain things that he is doing he is not afraid to be counter cultural right in many ways but uh, to be winsome paul says i will be everything to everybody for the sake of christ so he wants to be a jew to a jew a gentile to a gentile and so when he is going to jerusalem uh he says you know uh, let me be a jew to a jew so that i can win some jews to christ and he speaks about uh you know uh that greek uh court traveler to get circumcised so which is what we looked at last week in our galatian study so you can go back and refer as to why that happens uh but i am beginning as i am reading paul's epistles i'm beginning to really really Paul uh, in in not love with Paul amazed at the amount of revelation that one man can get and contribute to the corpus and when he speaks about slaves here in this context he is uh, first of all we need to understand the context and understand the idea of slavery at that particular point in time there are helpers that work for us right most of us that are working husbands and wives sometimes we recruit uh, helpers that uh, take care of our housework right so they are in some ways you know uh, the modern version of quote and quote what is called as bonded uh, laborers in the old testament and uh, how are they bonded in modern times they are uh, committing to come from a particular time to a particular time and finish uh, this work and that work and get paid so much and then go home In the old testament times the bonded servants would stay with the master they would generally not have families if they had families the entire family would stay they would not have resources they would have committed themselves to work for a particular master and be employed and they would be uh, uh, they would be uh, considered as part of the household now were all uh, slave masters uh, good masters christ like masters no okay there there were bad slave masters there were those that abused slaves and so on and so forth but here again beautifully in chapter 6 when he speaks about uh, slaves and slave masters he finally says both of us come under eternal judgment under our one impartial master so you're a master here on earth you're my earthly master but you also are a slave to jesus christ who is your heavenly eternal impartial master for both of us Uh, so he says even to the earthly masters that you will treat your uh, slaves well and all of that so because of the use of the word doulos or slave don't think of them being chained them being flogged them being beaten them being abused and all of that just think of them as you know a helper that comes to our house and does some service for us uh, as part of a contract or a commitment which in the old olden days was called as a bond and every 7 years they would be given a choice of release okay most of them would choose to stay with their masters every 49th year is a, a is the year of jubilee now, everything had to be restored back and so uh, so it is not like you know forever tied to the master's home and uh, be an object of scorn and uh, uh you know like like the idea of slavery we get from the egyptian times by looking at the 10 commandments movie no that's not the idea yeah hope that helps thank you thank, thank you charles uh charles we have a last question from uh, the mm-hmm. uh question in efficiency 3 1819 how to understand the heights depths width of god's love any insights mm-hmm. in bracket one is christ death for us on the cross of calvary and continue to it in ephesians 2 verses 18 and 19 no 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 uh, the first part i understood what is the second part you are reading aditya is that a part of the first question yeah yeah he said no, one thing we can understand is through christ death any other insight or that oh i i uh, i i really uh, uh, see uh, one of course i mean you can in a in an allegorical figurative way say 
uh, Christ's death is the depth of his love. Uh, but again, that uh, uh, that would probably be an allegorical way in which we are understanding the depth of love. Basically, I think what uh, Paul uh, wants to convey here is that the love of Christ is unfathomable. Okay, you cannot measure it. You cannot fathom it. You, you cannot use your intellect to understand the limits of it in any dimension. And that is why he uses the height, the breadth, the, the depth, and the width of God's love. Now, uh, I'm imagining, and many scholars are also imagining, uh, you know, Paul, whenever he's writing about the uh, armor of God, whenever he's writing about perhaps even this, locked up in a, uh, in a Roman uh, prison or in a cell, or even under house arrest, uh, you know, there are several themes around him that would have invoked imageries in him. And as a writer, he may have been prompted to incorporate those. Definitely, there was a soldier that was tied to him. He looked at the soldier, decked up in his armor, and the Spirit of God inspired him to take that and use it. Perhaps I'm thinking, if he were, uh, you know, in a prison, right, and uh, sitting and uh, looking at the the height and the length and the depth and the darkness and the depravity and the, the hope of a release. Most prisons were underground uh, in those days. Definitely the Marmotine prison in which Paul was at one particular point in time uh, was like that. Uh, so I'm just thinking uh, uh, any of this could have inspired him. So I don't think he uh, necessarily has to, we have to think of the depth of God's love as the death of Jesus the height of God's love as the ascension of Jesus, you know, the breadth of God's love as the entire universe, or including Gentiles and Jews, uh, and so on and so forth. We can do that, but it would be reading too much into the text. The basic idea is that the love of God is unfathomable, unmeasurable in any dimension, and that we are to be in awe of that love and not be actually trying to uh, measure that and we can imagine it to be yes you know the height of ascension the depth of uh, uh, you know the death of Jesus and so on and so forth it would not be wrong as long as we are uh, keeping uh, our imagination you know within a certain context and rooting it and validating it uh, uh, from the pages of the bible but uh, yeah so these are some of my thoughts Danny I'm, I'm sorry uh, I don't know if there is a theological idea that Paul has when he speaks of height, depth, breadth, and width. I, I can only think of it as the, in all dimensions, God's love is unfathomable, immeasurable, and that we can't, uh, you know, quantify it. We can be in awe of it, and we can fall down and worship, and be uh, amazed at it for eternity. And uh, that's the idea I get. Hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chalsana. I think we came to the end of today's close. session. Yeah, we can close. Uh, can, I, uh, can I ask Brother Russo to end with the word of prayer? Brother Russo. A loving Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today's session. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us clearly enriching our minds, understanding the depth and the height of your love, what you have done on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for all the proceedings that went on well today. We especially thank God for Brad Charles, who is taking much pains to prepare and to teach us so that we may be of some use to the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all the comforts we receive through your word. Lord, let us not only be hearers of your word, but also doers of your word. Be, be with us and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brother Russo. And thanks, everyone, for staying back. I'm so sorry we overshot time this time by quite a bit. Yeah. Thank you so much, Adi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.